Thank you very much, Nuri, uh, for this introduction and for the invitation to present here. Um, and thank you also to Andre and Ryan uh, for putting together this seminar series. This has been one of the highlights of this very unusual times, I guess, that we are all going through. So um, as Nuri mentioned, this is a joint work with uh, Ronnie Micheli and Martin Schmalz. And this is a paper that we've been working for too long a time now, I guess, but uh, we, we have a brand new revision with uh, new results and we are very much looking forward to your comments as we, you know, as we think through how to continue hopefully making this, this, this paper better. So um, let me start kind of just by uh, motiva motivating what we're trying to do in, in the paper. Uh, there's been, in recent years in particular, there's been growing concerns about finance payouts. Uh, for instance, in uh, 2019, uh, the IMF had this uh, report about kind of global financial stability, where they made the point that debt has been rising, has risen and is increasingly used for financial risk taking, in particular uh, to fund corporate payouts to investors, especially in the United States. Now, not surprisingly, a number of uh, public commentators have been uh, also raising concerns about these uh, debt finance uh, payouts, uh, for instance, uh, William uh, Lazonic and co-authors in writing in the Harvard Business uh, Review, they made this point that debt finance buybacks reinforce financial fragility, but they say it is actually stock buybacks, uh, however funded, that undermine the quest for equitable and stable economic growth. Buybacks done as open market repurchases should therefore be banned. And kind of not surprisingly, uh, these uh, calls to kind of limit or restrict uh, corporate uh, buybacks have uh, been amplified or have found uh, an audience among uh, policymakers. For instance, uh, uh, Chuck Schumer and uh, Bernie Sanders writing in the New York Times, they had this editorial where they said uh, that corporate stock buybacks should, should be limited. And of course, since the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the things that kind of became clear or one of the concerns that was raised was that some of the companies that uh, needed government help, in particular airlines, they were now in a more fragile position than they would have been if they had taken a more conservative financial policy in, in the past, and in particular, if they hadn't relied on debt finance uh, repurchases to try to uh, allegedly, if you will, uh, boost their, their stock price. Now, to be sure, these concerns about firms uh, raising capital in order to, to fund repurchases are, are not new. And for instance, back in 2010, Bloomberg had an, uh, an article saying uh, how buybacks were jumping as companies borrowed for, for the stock purchases. Now, if you take a step back and you try to look at uh, finance payouts from the point of view of the finance literature, and in particular of the payout literature, this phenomenon is actually hard to reconcile with the traditional view of payouts in, in the literature. Uh, for instance, in a well-known uh, corporate finance textbook, Ross, Westerfield, and Jaffe, they make the point that a firm should begin making distributions when it generates sufficient internal cash flow to fund its investment needs now and into the foreseeable future. And they say that firms should set level of payouts low enough to avoid expensive future external financing. Now, so this kind of goes back to the conventional uh, wisdom in the payout literature that essentially says that payout should be funded primarily uh, with free cash flow. And uh, for instance, if you think about one of the best uh, known uh, theories, if you will, of payout policy out there, the life cycle view of the firm posits that young firms should raise capital in order to fund their investments, whereas mature firms should pay out excess free cash flow. So it, this essentially suggests that you should not see the same firm raising and paying out capital at the same time. So what we try to do in this paper, first of all, is to try to get a sense of actually how prevalent and how large in terms of their dollar, dollar magnitude are uh, finance payouts. And we find that they are actually very large. 43% uh, of payout payers of firms that uh, have either a share repurchase or a pay a dividend initiate a net debt or an equity issuance in the same year that they pay a dividend or repurchase shares. In terms of the aggregate magnitude of, of finance payouts, uh, finance payouts, we find that 31% of the aggregate capital that firms pay out in a given year is actually raised by the same firms during that same year, mostly as I'll, I'll show you with, with that. And uh, we show that actually repurchases are more common, finance repurchases are more common than finance regular dividends. So once we kind of, you know, quantify the, the magnitude of, of, of finance payouts, our next step is to try and understand or enhance our understanding of why firms might choose to do this. 
given that there are obvious costs in a policy of raising external capital and use this capital to pay out to shareholders. And we find that one key driver, by no means the only driver, but one key driver of this uh, behavior is firm desire to jointly manage their capital structure and their cash holdings for tax considerations. In particular, to both take advantage of the tax deductibility of interest payments and to avoid paying repatriation taxes, as I'll, as I'll show you in detail. Finally, in the last, in the third part of the paper, we try to shed further light on what are the consequences of this phenomenon, of this behavior. And what we find is that uh, there is a, the very least suggestive evidence that debt finance payouts do increase firms' exposure to negative shocks, uh, particularly in the case of firms that don't have an investment grade credit rating. But importantly, the same is not true for internally funded payouts. So kind of these are the, the, the three key findings of the three key parts of the paper that I'll walk you through in detail uh, you know, over the next hour or so. Now, before I do this, let me just highlight kind of three what we see as important contributions of, of the paper to kind of place it a little bit on in the literature. Uh, so first of all, we think that ours is the first systematic analysis of how firms fund their payouts. Now, to be sure, other papers have made the point that firms occasionally may engage in, for instance, leverage recaps, essentially debt finance payouts, or also payout finance uh, with, with equity. But uh, we think that the pervasiveness, magnitude, and persistence of finance payouts that uh, we document, uh, and in the fact that it suggests that 40% of payout payers do not follow the textbook advice of funding payouts internally, is something that hasn't been appreciated until kind of, we, we documented this. Now, second, uh, we think that our paper helps enhance our understanding of the motives behind payout policies. And in particular, it makes this point that uh, firms rely on finance payouts to actively manage their capital structure, which is most consistent with the trade of theories of capital structure. And in particular, it's harder to reconcile with kind of traditional pecking order uh, theories, where, for instance, Myers in 1994, he makes this point that an unusually profitable firm will end up with an usually low debt ratio and it won't do much of anything about it it won't go out of its way to issue debt and retire equity to achieve a more normal debt ratio. So we, we actually show that it looks like, you know, a substantial amount of firms do go out of their way, if you will, to issue debt and retire equity to try to uh, get closer to their target capital structure. Now, to be sure, other reasons that we don't study directly are also important in motivating firms to engage in financing of payouts. For instance, agency considerations, cross-market arbitrage, as a recent JF paper by Ma points out, or even monetary policy considerations, as a recent paper by Viral Acharya and Pantene uh, makes, makes clear. And then finally, kind of this uh, new set of results that we have around uh, the financial fragility of firms kind of makes the point that, uh, at least you know, from the point of view of, of, our, of our findings, it looks like not all payouts should be treated equally if you know, policymakers are thinking of any kind of regulation or restrictions on, on payouts, because it looks like the source of payout financing matters when it comes to their impact on financial fragility. So it's not the same, if you will, to have uh, payouts that are funded with internal funds than to have payout finance in particular with debt uh, when it comes to their potential impact on, on financial fragility. So kind of uh, that's that's you know, the paper in a nutshell, if you will. So before I start uh, getting into you know, the details of how we, how we show this, uh, maybe I, should, you know, I can just stop and see if there are any, any questions. Uh, we have one question right now, Juan. Uh, it's about like firms could increase their leverage even without stock repurchases. I mean, is it different or worse or better when they do it for repurchase? Like uh, does the increase in leverage differ uh, when repurchase is involved? Sure. So, uh, so first of all, I guess, um, in a, just from a purely, you know, mechanical standpoint, if you will, the increase in leverage is, is higher if you raise that and pay it out than if you just um, raise that and kind of keeps the, keep the proceeds as, as cash. And, you know, sometimes the literature thinks of perhaps net leverage as, so leverage net of cash being uh, actually what, what firms might target. And in this case, uh, pay, uh, raising debt and paying it out allows firms to increase their net leverage, whereas just uh, raising debt and keeping the, the proceeds uh, doesn't. 
for instance, as in, in one of the tests that, that, that I'll show you, the, when we try to understand whether uh, tax motivations, in particular, the avoidance of corporate income taxes uh, might be a driver of debt finance payouts, one of the things that, that, that we argue is that the fact that firms raise debt and pay it out allows firms to make sure that the kind of tax savings that are generated from the interest expense are not offset by interest income that the firms would earn if they were to keep the proceeds as, as cash in, in their balance sheet. So that's certainly a, 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 a fair point that, you know, both uh, just raising debt would also allow firms to increase their leverage, but uh, kind of the, the quantitative impact is different and also uh, some of the tax implications in particular. Okay, the second question is like, do you see any agency uh, considerations behind uh, that decision? Sure. So that's that's one certainly one of the drivers that that, that we think that might might be uh, operating and might be motivating firms to engage in debt finance payout. This was a, a point that was done, for instance, in the case of debt. Uh, you know, it goes back to Jensen in kind of uh, his 1986 paper, um, and that's and that's one of the channels that definitely we think uh, is operating here. Uh, we kind of have chosen to focus when it comes to, as, as I'll show you, when it, try, when it comes to trying to find, you know, well-identified, hopefully causal evidence of the motives behind uh, debt finance payout. We've chosen, we've uh, focused on uh, tax optimization as the channel where we think that we have plausibly exogenous variation in, in, in tax incentives to engage in debt finance payouts. And that's kind of the channel that we try to identify uh, more clearly in the second part of the paper but i, I do want to you know be clear that i do think that other motives are certainly operating here and agency considerations for sure is 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 one of them um it's just one that for lack of a you know better way to put it we we are not able to clearly identify in in this draft of the paper at least and so we mention it as certainly a driver that is operating but not one on which we have uh, direct evidence that that i can show you today okay thank you Sure. Um, and please, you know, keep keep the questions coming. Um, so, so let me just kind of quickly uh, tell you about uh, our our data. Uh, so, our uh, sample of firms is is a standard. These are uh, firms from 1989 to 2019, and we exclude financial firms and utilities, and also firms in the year of the IPO, so that we are not capturing the, the IPO proceeds. Um, in terms of kind of the main variables that that come into our analysis. Uh, Free cash flow, so all, all our data comes from the statement of cash flows in, in Compostat. So free cash flow is going to be operating cash flow plus investment cash flow, which is essentially a negative flow for, for most firms. Uh, when, whenever I talk in, you know, throughout this presentation about uh, debt issuances, uh, it's always going to be net debt issuances. So we always subtract uh, debt repurchases from debt issuances. So we are actually, we're always capturing essentially a net inflow of cash that uh, goes to the company from issuing debt above and beyond any debt that is used to retire previously issue, issued debt. And then when it comes to, to equity, even though as, as you'll see, it's not a, it's not a, a big player in, in, in our paper because equity finance payouts are relatively small, but we still try to be careful. And in particular, we try to distinguish between essentially firm initiated equity issuances. So that's, you know, SEOs, private placements, uh, you know, usual ways how a firm goes and actively raises equity in the capital markets. And we, ha we try to distinguish this from essentially employee initiated equity issuances. So that typically are as a, the result of employee stock option exercises and the firm actually, you know, oftentimes ends up getting a cash inflow from this option exercises from essentially the employees paying the strike price. And that, you know, it features in, in Compostad, you capture it in, you know, as an equity issuance. But we think that that's, you know, that doesn't actually correspond to a firm that is actively choosing to raise capital. And so we, we break it down. And whenever we talk about finance payouts in this paper, we always talk about payouts that are financed either with net debt or with firm initiated equity issuances, but we don't count uh, any payouts that will be financed from the proceeds of the stock option exercises, because we think that's not actually uh, the firm actively deciding to, to, to do that. Um, so also kind of in the spirit, if, if you will, of um, providing you some summary stats. Uh, so think of, you know, these two, two pictures here that are as our summary stats uh, table. Um, let me just kind of show you what's been the evolution of payouts in the aggregate 
in the US over our uh, sample period. So as I guess it's not really going to surprise anybody, uh, payouts have, have increased, in, increased in a very substantial way over our sample period. And you see how uh, the volatility of payouts, and in particular, the procyclicality of payouts, is pretty much entirely driven by uh, share repurchases, which are much more volatile than uh, regular dividends that have been kind of increasing, increasing it in a much more smooth way over our sample period. Uh, just, you know, as a technical point, uh, we are adding up to share repurchases throughout the paper special dividends because they also kind of are thought not to have this persistent sticky component of regular dividends, but uh, they are very small uh, in, in dollar terms relative to repurchases. So it really doesn't make a difference what we do with special dividends. Uh, and then in terms of kind of firms uh, raising, raising capital, uh, you can see how net debt issuances by far are much, much larger in dollar magnitude than employee initiated equity issuances or firm initiated equity issuances, which are substantially smaller. And you can see how, you know, there's also a procyclicality on the debt issuance uh, side. So, you know, you just look at this, at this picture, you could say, well, yeah, it looks like when firms are paying out more, they, they are also raising more, more debt. But of course this, you know, kind of uh, the fact that these two lines move together, this could just be different firms that are raising debt or uh, paying, out, paying out capital. And so in order to really get to the point of, is it the same firms that are quote unquote financing their payouts, we need to move our analysis to, to the firm level. And that's, and that's what we do in kind of the next set of analysis that I'm gonna show you. We are gonna uh, define the amount of payout that is financed at the firm year level as the minimum of the payout that the firm pays and the amount of firm initiated issuance proceed that the firm raises. So whenever uh, this, uh, this number is positive, we're gonna say that the firm has a finance payout and the amount uh, of this positive amount, it's gonna be the amount of the finance payout. And as you can see, this is kind of, for this to be positive, it needs to be the case that in the same year, the same firm is paying out capital uh, and raising capital via net debt or firm initiated equity issuances. So I'm next gonna show, I'm next gonna show you firm counts and dollar magnitudes of how prevalent this phenomenon is. But uh, I saw there is, there is a question, so maybe I'll, I'll take it now, Nuri. Sure, we have a question. The question is about like non-investment grade firms that you talked about in the introduction. Uh, basically the question is how can these firms issue debt and pay dividends? Like uh, are they, aren't they constrained? Um, so I think, you know, kind of that, that might have been our, um, also our expectation going, you know, uh, going into this project that, that, you know, that's something that in particular firms without an investment grade rating uh, wouldn't do. It turns out that they do it. So uh, uh, close to 72% uh, of all firms that engage in this behavior don't have an investment grade rating. And the, the way how these firms can, can do it as, as, I'll, as, I'll, as I'll discuss a little bit more later is these tend to be firms that are growing. So the fact that these firms are growing allows these firms to essentially uh, raise debt and pay out the, the, the proceeds without their uh, leverage exploding. Um, so this is, you know, you can think of these as firms that they, uh, their free cash flow is zero because the profits that they generate, they actually, they invest them to fund their, their growth. So they have zero free cash flow. But if the firms, they just kept growing by reinvesting their profits, essentially their leverage will fall. And so uh, they use debt finance payouts and in particular debt finance repurchases to kind of try to keep their leverage stable or at least to make sure that their leverage doesn't fall um, below their target level as they are, as they are growing. But you know, you're right that, you know, you, that there must be substantial costs uh, in engaging in this behavior, uh, particularly for firms that don't have an investment grade rating because the cost of issuing debt for them are, are certainly not trivial. And so this does suggest that, you know, the fact that they are trying to so actively manage their capital structure suggests that they, there must be important benefits that they see in doing this that offset this, this cost. So that's, that's, that's the way we, we think about this. I see. Uh, the second question is, do you have a sense of the ratio between payout and issuance proceeds? Um, so, so essentially, so that's what that's what I'm that's what I'm going to show you next. Uh, but approximately in the case of debt, um, it's a little bit over forty percent 
of the net debt that uh, firms raise every year that is paid out uh, during the same year. So 40% at the aggregate level, 40% um, of, of the net debt issuance proceeds are just essentially paid out by the same firm during the same year that is raising the, the capital, which to us is, you know, it's much larger than, than we certainly would have expected because, you know, this, this suggests that kind of funding uh, payouts is, is a major use of the capital that front raise, and particularly the debt that front raise in, in the capital markets. I see. Uh, the following question is, wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be optimal to increase investments instead of increasing payouts for high growth firms? Um, I guess, I mean, you know, that's, 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 that's a good question. Our, the fact that firms don't do it, that firms, you know, they are choosing to pay out rather than, than increase investments suggests that they think that, that it would. Uh, now, you know, of course you can, you know, you can think that there might also be some agency considerations here that, you know, make firms behave in a way that is not necessarily optimal. Um, but, but yeah, I think that's, you know, I think that that's, that's a good point and that probably explains why, you know, we had, you know, always thought or at least, you know, certainly the payout literature had thought as payouts just as a way for firms to, um, you know, return to shareholders the capital that they, that they feel that they don't need once, in a sense, they've already undertaken all the profitable investment opportunities. And, and you know, we, we find that for a substantial amount of firms, the process is more complex than that. And firms actually, uh, you know, rely on, on debt issuances in particular to, to fund their payouts. Okay, Juan, there is one more question, but I will ask it in the next round. Thank you. Awesome, thank you. Uh, so let me start kind of, you know, putting some, some numbers to our uh, effort to quantify this, this, this phenomenon. So first of all, here, I'm just showing you at the, at the firm count level, if you will, um, what's the fraction of all public firms that simultaneously raise and pay out capital in a given year. And you can see how the average over our sample period is around 22%. And it has, you know, if anything, has increased a little bit, you know, in since the Great Recession, essentially, and it's now closer to, to 30%. Whereas uh, the red line is showing you what's the fraction of all firms that uh, pay out capital that also simultaneously raise, raise capital. And you can see how this fraction is, is substantially higher, is around uh, 43% over, over our sample period. And again, you see how it goes down during a recession recession period so kind of this is where our one of our headline numbers come from uh, the idea that 43 percent of all firms that pay out capital they are simult simultaneously raising capital uh, now you could you know you could say well maybe these are just like you know tiny amounts that the firms are kind of financing of their payout so if we want to look at this in terms of dollar magnitudes here i'm breaking down the amount of payouts that are financed every year by net debt issuances and by firm initiated equity issuances. And you can see, first of all, how uh, payout finance with net debt issuances are much larger than payout finance with firm initiated equity issuances. And second of all, you can see how the economic magnitude of this uh, phenomenon is actually substantial. And in fact, 31% of aggregate payouts are simultaneously raised in the capital markets by the same firms that are paying out in, in the same year. So again, these are firms that they don't rely on the free cash flow to fund their payouts, but that actually they are raising the capital that they pay out from, from the debt market in particular. So just to kind of summarize our um, quantification findings, if you will, of, of, uh, of the extent to which firms uh, finance their payouts, we find that simultaneous payouts and security issuances are prevalent. So 43% of all payout payers do this. To be clear, it's not everybody, but it is 43%. Uh, they are economically large, but the 1% of aggregate payouts are actually simultaneously raised by the same firms in the same year. And they are strongly procyclical, at least certainly until 2015. 55% uh, are made via share repurchases and special dividends, and 45% are regular dividends. And uh, as you've seen, they are mostly financed with debt. And if kind of, I think this was. Uh, uh, this was the question that I got earlier. So what percentage of the proceeds of net debt issuances is used to, in a sense, finance payouts? That's uh, this 41% that I mentioned. So 41% of the net 
proceeds of the issuances are simultaneously paid out by the same firms during the same year. So, you know, a very, a very kind of significant use of the capital that firms raise in the debt markets seems to be to just fund uh, payouts and in particular share, share repurchases. The, the next step that we try to take in order to, you know, get a little bit deeper to, to understanding this, this phenomenon is to try and see whether the firms that finance their payouts, which again, so far I just define as simultaneously in the same year, uh, raising and paying out capital, they actually need to raise this external capital to be able to pay out as much as they do, given their investment and their profit levels, or whether, you know, on the other hand, you might still imagine a firm that is uh, raising debt and then just using the debt proceeds to increase its cash balances and also at the same time paying out capital that it could just easily fund from, from its internal funds. So in order to do this, we define this, this concept of the payout gap, which essentially this mid-max is just trying to make sure that it's between zero and the payout level. And essentially what it does is it uh, looks at uh, the extent to which the firm's internal funds are sufficient to fund the payouts of the, of the, of the firm. And by internal funds here, we have the free cash flow of the firm. So, you know, any profit in excess of, of investment, uh, but also any cash reduction that the firm might undertake. And also we, you know, in order to try to be conservative here, if you will, we also add up here the proceeds of employee initiated equity issuances as essentially, you know, unwanted free cash flows that the firm uh, gets from, you know, employees exercising their, their stock options. And what we find is that for the vast majority of firms that finance their payouts, 84%, they, they do have a payout gap. So these are firms that indeed, they will not have been able to sustain their payout levels given their internal funds, even after we include any cash reductions and the proceeds of employee initiated equity issuances. Now, in addition to that, uh, we, can, we can do a similar kind of analysis but instead of defining the payout gap on a year by year level, we can do this by aggregating the payouts and by aggregating the internal funds that the firm generate over a five year period. And in a sense, what this allows us to, to, to see is to what extent is this payout financing behavior just a, a result of firms trying to have a smooth payouts over time and having volatile cash flows or maybe a volatile investment. And what we actually see is that the prevalence of payout gaps increases and their aggregate magnitude remains unchanged when we define payout gaps over five year intervals. So this suggests that these payout gaps are persistent and indeed these are firms that even when you look over a five year window, they are paying out more than their internal funds, than the internal funds that, that they generate. So they do need to raise this external capital and in particular this debt in order to be able to sustain their payout level, because not even over you know, a five year period are their internal funds sufficient to sustain their payout level. So um, these firms kind of, without the proceeds of, of the debt issuances that, that they are raising, they will be unable to, to sustain their payouts if they were just relying on their, on their internal funds. So that's, um, that finishes uh, kind of the first part of, of the paper, if you will which is where we try to quantify uh, how prevalent and how large in magnitude this, this phenomenon is. And now I'm going to jump to kind of trying to, to, to understand, trying to see why firms might engage in, in this phenomenon. What, what are some of the motives that, that can explain it? So uh, I don't know if maybe I can take a, a question. I think there is one before I jump to the second part of, of the presentation. Yes, Juan. Uh, the, actually, the first question is about there's uh, payout gaps. So do you separate firms that consistently pay dividends and firms that only do buybacks? Because like payout gaps for dividend paying firms uh, might be mechanical since, since dividend is sticky. Right, that's, that's, that's a, great, uh, a great point. So um, you're right that if, you, if all the, if all the uh, finance payouts, they were essentially just taking the, the form of um, dividends, you might think, well, uh, firms are just doing this because they just don't want to cut their dividends. Uh, we know, as you know, the question said that dividends are sticky, that uh, managers uh, perceive a very substantial um, costs in, in cutting dividends or even in failing uh, 
to increase dividends you know uh, to the to the level expected by by their shareholders and so you could say okay maybe firms they are just doing this so that they 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 don't have to cut cut their dividends they don't have to disappoint their their shareholders and uh, and what we find is that actually 55 percent of finance payouts they take the form of either share repurchases or you know much less important special dividends where you don't have this kind of a stickiness component so um you know if you want to think about this you can think of you know up to 45 percent of of um of finance payouts could potentially be explained by firms reluctance to cut their their regular dividends but the remaining 55 percent so you know uh actually more more than half cannot because it is taking the shape of share repurchases where you don't have this sticky sticky component and this is also the reason why uh when uh when we try to uh in in the second part of the paper and also in the third part of the paper we are going to focus all our analysis on uh debt finance repurchases and the reason for this is essentially because we say okay uh, you know, it is possible that debt finance dividends or in general finance dividends, they, they are just explained by the reluctance to cut dividends. And this is a phenomenon that, that, that is well understood in, in the literature. So um, we are just going to focus all our efforts in terms of the why part of the paper, why firms do this on uh, debt financial repurchases, because they are larger actually than debt finance dividends and, and they cannot be explained by kind of this well-known reluctance to, to cut dividends. So that's, you know, that's, that's certainly a good point. And that's why from now on, uh, everything I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do and say is going to be focused around uh, debt finance repurchases. I see. Uh, the next question is about the policy implication of your findings. Uh, you can defer it to the end of the paper too, to answer this. Like the question is about like wooden policies constraining payouts finance through that be more effective if they restrict leverage ratios for firms. I mean, after all, it's not the repurchase which is causing fragility, but leverage uh, that will be more direct. Yes, uh, but I, I think we need, we need, I feel like we need a structural model to answer such type of question. No, I mean, I so let me at least. Um, so I don't have we don't have a structural model, but let me let me offer offer my thoughts. Um, um, and maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit here, but one one of the things that that we are going to show you know, in just, I guess, five slides or something like that, was that a big uh, motive for debt finance repurchases is going to be tax optimization. And so if, you know, if you were to ask me, what is the, you know, what is the one policy that, that you think, you know, might make sense, uh, you know, in light of our findings here, and also in light of many other findings in the literature, and, you know, we're certainly not the first to say this, will be to, you know, think carefully or rethink the, preference that the tax code gives to debt over equity. I think that, you know, a lot of the efforts that we see on, you know, from the part of firms in particular, you know, by engaging in debt finance repurchases uh, to kind of optimize uh, their capital structure and to increase leverage to kind of take advantage of the, of the tax deductibility of interest payment, um, you know, will, will be avoided if, if you just got got rid of this tax preference of debt over over equity so i think that that i think it's in the spirit of what the question was saying you know i wouldn't you know regulate um certainly payout or not even debt finance payouts and you know not even leverage targets at least you know not for you know certainly not for non-financial firms um but but i think that you know you could make a case uh that there are you know there are aspects of our tax code that are incentivizing firms to Kind of engage in these tax optimization exercises that in the third part of the paper we at least you know have suggestive evidence that points to to these uh to these efforts increasing firms financial fragility so if you you know if a policymaker is concerned that this is you know something that that is not good uh you know for our society as a whole because it generates externalities or maybe a moral hazard in that firms then are counting on you know bailouts from the you know public uh, sector I think that doing away with these uh, tax um, incentives that incentivize firms to, 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 to have high levels of, of debt, I think that's where I would start. Thank you, Juan. But again, I feel like, um, you know, maybe I should have deferred the question because I, uh, you know, 
there's a bunch of things that I that I said that I still haven't shown you. So so let me let me start start to to, to fill fill in these gaps. Sure. Uh, so so the first thing that that we kind of do in our in this effort to try to uh, shed light on what might be the motives behind debt finance purchases that is going to be our focus, uh, you know, for the rest of the paper is just to run, if you will, uh, you know, plain vanilla regression. Uh, where we try to look at the characteristics of firms that uh, have debt financing purchases and also uh, compare them to those that have internally funded purchases that they, they are the purchasing shares that they are just funding uh, with their free cash flow. And uh, this is just to be clear, this is a, a profit model where uh, I'm showing you marginal effects. And in this, for instance, in column one, the dependent variable is the dummy if the firm has a debt finance purchase. And what you can see is that it is firms with high leverage and with uh, high cash that are less likely to have a, a debt finance purchase. So this kind of goes back to, to, this, to this idea that I already uh, hinted at earlier, that combining payouts with efficiencies allows firms to increase their leverage without depleting their cash, uh, their cash reserves. And what, what is important to note here is that we also find that firms that have high market to book, so growth firms, are more likely to engage in debt finance reports, which again goes back to this idea that these are firms that uh, are growing. And so the fact that these firms are growing allows these firms to engage in these debt finance purchases without that leverage uh, exploding. Whereas if you kind of compare uh, firms that engage in internally funded purchases, you see two main differences. One, these are firms that are are less likely to be firms that are growing, and also these are firms that tend to have more cash. So again, this, you know, in a sense, this goes back to, to this difference. If a firm wants to increase its leverage because it, it finds itself being under leverage, uh, it has two channels that, that, that it can use. If the firm is, is not growing a lot and has a lot of cash, it can just make a, a report just, and that will, of course, increase the leverage. But if the firm is a high growth firm that kind of doesn't have a lot of cash or needs all the cash it has to, to fund its growth, then uh, a debt finance purchase will allow the firm to increase its, uh, its leverage without depleting its, its, its cash holdings. So let me, let me kind of give you a sense of, you know, given that the regression estimates, you know, it's hard to see how quantitatively important these, these channels are. Uh, let me give you a sense of kind of the extent to which uh, debt finance purchases allow firms to increase their leverage and then also to, to keep their cash from, from falling. So what I'm showing you here is, let's begin by focusing on, on the black line. What I'm showing you here is the evolution of the target leverage, so the deviation uh, between the firm's uh, level of leverage and the target just implied by a standard capital structure model. Uh, for firms that have a debt finance purchase in year zero. So this is the year of the debt finance purchase. And what I'm doing here is I'm showing you, so think of this as a graph in event time, if you will. So year zero is the, is the, is the year of the debt finance purchase, and I'm showing you the median. Uh, and then I'll show you the, the, the mean. So what you can see is that firms that have a debt finance purchase in year zero, the year before the debt finance purchase, their leverage was around five percentage points below target. So again, this goes back to this idea that these are firms that they find themselves uh, under levered and they use the debt finance purchase to increase their leverage pretty much to the target level and then the leverage stays at this, at this level. Now, what we try to do in, with the red line is we try to do a counterfactual exercise where we essentially allow the firm to have uh, either issue debt or report shares uh, so we allow the firm to increase the, the leverage, you know, via these two traditional mechanisms, if we, if you will, but we net out the effect of any debt financing purchases. So if the firm issues debt, we just kind of assume, we counterfactually assume that the amount of the debt issuance is uh, lowered by the by the amount of debt that the firm is repurchasing, and kind of to keep things consistent, we also assume that the amount of repurchases of the firm are lowered by the amount of, uh, of those purchases that are debt finance. And what you can see here is that if firms did this, the leverage still goes up in year zero because again, we are still allowing the firm to either issue debt or repurchase shares. Uh, 
but the increase will be will be not sufficient will not be sufficient to to get to the target leverage and in the subsequent years the level of leverage of the firm will further deviate from its target so what this is telling us in a sense is that you know um it points to the to the at least quantitative importance of combining both debt issuances and repurchases for these firms to get to their to their target leverage. What I'm showing you here is exactly the same exercise, but now instead of looking at the median firm, I'm uh, plotting the target leverage deviation for the mean firm. And what you can see is that everything, you know, if you compare to to the prior one, everything kind of shifts upward. And uh, what you see is that in this case, the mean firm is actually appears to be overshooting its target leverage by around, you know, close to four percentage points in the year of the of the debt finance purchase. So while the median firm seems to just, you know, use debt finance purchases to all but get, you know, to hit the, the leverage target, uh, we do see that some, you know, a, a non-trivial fraction of firms, they appear to be overshooting that leverage target. And these are, uh, I would argue, these are the firms that, you know, if an unexpected shock happens, you know, around here when they have, in a sense, over levered, that's where we observe these negative consequences uh, that we document in, in the third part of, of the paper. Um, to, to kind of wrap up this quantitative exercise, let me now show you what happens to cash levels, because again, we, you know, I've, uh, I've made this point that it is the combination of debt issuances and, and reports that allows the firms to increase the leverage without depleting or increasing the, the cash reserves. And you can see how indeed, uh, that's what the black line is showing you here, the cash level of the firms that engage in a debt finance reports stays stable over, over time. And what the red line does here is essentially just tries to look at what will be the cash level of these firms if they just try to achieve the same leverage increase by uh, increasing their repurchases without simultaneously issuing debt. And what you can see is that 81% of the firms that have a debt finance repurchase, they just don't have enough cash to achieve that leverage target um, by simply repurchasing more. So this really points to, to, to the need to combine uh, repurchases with debt issuances to achieve the leverage target, because if the firms were just trying to repurchase more, they will essentially, you know, they will just fall into negative cash territory, which of course is, is not feasible. Okay, so so kind of, you know, you can think of, of this as trying to, to get a, a sense of how quantitatively important debt finance purchases are in terms of uh, allowing firms to increase their leverage, but it still doesn't really tell us why. Why do why are firms trying to kind of increase their 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 leverage? And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna we're gonna kind of go back to the trade of theory of capital structure and in particular focus on tax motives uh, as, a, as a potential driver for debt finance purchases as a way to for firms to increase their, their leverage. And in particular, I'm going to uh, look at two different type of tax incentives, if you will, uh, just corporate income taxes and then repatriation taxes. And this is kind of this is the part of the paper where we try to, uh, you know, be, be you know, try to identify some causal effects, if, if you will, until now everything has been descriptive. But here, you know, we are trying to essentially, uh, you know, exploit variation in the tax incentives, exogenous variation in the tax incentives that firms face to try to uh, identify whether there is, there is indeed a, a causal effect from these changes in these tax incentives to firms' decision to engage in debt finance repurchases. And just as I, as I said earlier, this is not to say that all that financial purchases are just motivated by by tax incentives uh, this is kind of the point we're trying to make is that tax incentives are one important driver of these decisions and one where you know we feel that we can have some you know hopefully well identified evidence so uh we i'm going to do this in in two parts so in the first part we we look at uh Kind of corporate income tax minimization as a driver for for debt finance purchases, and here we are going to exploit state level tax increases as an exogenous shock to the firms' demand for leverage. So this go, goes back to a JFE paper by Hader and Lukvis, where they exploit staggered changes in state corporate income taxes as plausibly exogenous shocks to the value of interest tax deductions using a staggered if-in-if approach. 
And the idea here is that um, issuing debt allows firms to minimize their tax bill because the interest is tax deductible. And paying out the debt ensures that the tax savings are not offset by the new taxable interest income that will be generated if firms retain their, the proceeds as cash. And what we find is, so first of all, of course, this incentive should only be there for firms that face an effective marginal tax rate that is positive, so essentially firms that have profits to shield from tax. And we do find indeed that when a firm faces a tax increase uh, in year T minus one, it is more likely to have a debt financing purchase in, in, in the next year, which again suggests that uh, these tax increases motivate firms to use debt financing purchase as a way to increase their leverage to make use of or to uh, try to shield this additional tax rate that they are facing by having higher interest tax payments. And uh, you do not see the same when, as, as expected, when we look at firms that uh, face a, a zero marginal tax rate. So you can think of this as our placebo test, if you will. And these firms, uh, you don't see the same, the same, kind, of, the same kind of behavior. Um, so that kind of allows us to say that uh, tax uh, optimization, and in particular the, the avoidance or the minimization of the corporate income taxes that from space, that from space seems to be an important driver of debt finance reports. Now the second, also still staying in in the in the tax uh, arena, if you will, but uh, a different mechanism that we try to identify is firms desire to minimize repatriation taxes. And this goes back to, to the idea that until recently, until uh, 2018, US multinationals had incentives to hoard cash overseas to avoid repatriation taxes, a uh, point that has certainly been made by many others in, in the literature. Uh, the idea is that US firms uh, were taxed on their worldwide income, but they will pay only US taxes on foreign earnings when these foreign earnings were repatriated. And the way this worked was that when firms uh, repatriated their foreign, uh, their foreign earnings, they will have to pay essentially the difference between the tax, the US tax rate, uh, 35%, and the tax that they, will, that they had actually paid in the, in the foreign jurisdiction, which typically was lowered because the 35% rate in the US uh, prior to 2018 was higher than the vast majority of, of foreign countries. So this essentially, the idea is that debt finance payouts allowed firms to ensure that their net leverage will not fall, despite the fact that the firms were hoarding all this cash overseas to avoid paying repatriation taxes if they brought it here. And perhaps, you know, these firms could do this in hopes of a repatriation tax holiday, like the one in 2004, to bring back this foreign cash and, and repay them the, the debt. So now in late 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act essentially changed the way how the corporate uh, tax system worked in the US and in particular now foreign earnings are exempt from US tax, regardless of whether they are repatriated or, or not. So firms no longer have incentives to hoard cash overseas to avoid repatriation taxes. So what this allows us to do is essentially, you know, use a definitive uh, uh, approach around the, the 2018 tax regime change to see whether indeed prior to this tax regime change, it was firms that, uh, that, that would have faced a large cost if they had repatriated their foreign earnings that were more likely to engage in debt finance purchases. And that's, and that's indeed what we find when, you, when uh, we have, by the way, this is a regression where we have the same all other controls that, that I showed you earlier in our, in the first regression, just not showing them to kind of save, save space, but we have all, all the other controls. And what you see is that um, prior to the tax change in 2018, firms that had a higher, cost of repatriating their foreign earnings. So that is to say firms that earn a lot of money overseas and that this money that they earn overseas, it was taxed at a substantially lower rate than the US tax rate that they will pay if they're repatriating their earnings. These were the kind of firms that were more likely to have debt finance repurchases. But you no longer see this kind of association between the tax cost of repatriating earnings and the likelihood to engage in debt finance repurchases after 2018 once the TCGA is, is in the books. The flip side of that is that you should also see that prior to the tax change, firms that face this large tax cost of repatriating foreign earnings, they were less likely to have internally funded repurchases because for them, uh, having an internally funded repurchase will have 
implied that they had to repatriate the foreign cash and so they will have had to pay repatriation taxes. And indeed, that's, that's what we find prior to the, to the tax change. Uh, the tax code of repatriating foreign earnings is negatively associated with the likelihood of having an internally funded reports, but this association completely goes away once we have the tax change and essentially, you know, the, the, the sum of these two coefficients is insignificant uh, after uh, 20, 2018. So that's kind of what, what, what suggests to us that this uh, avoidance of repatriation taxes was indeed a major driver of uh, debt finance repurchases. If you want to kind of see dynamically how, how this association changed, you can see how um, during all the 2000s up until 20, 2018, you saw this positive association between the tax cost of repatriating foreign earnings and the likelihood that firms had of engaging in debt finance repurchases. But then this association completely goes away uh, in 2018 once the tax regi regime changes, which is exactly what you would expect if kind of uh, the avoidance of repatriation taxes was indeed a major driver of debt finance repurchases prior to, to the tax regime change. So I'll, I'll now move towards the, the, the third and last part of the paper where we try to shed some uh, light on the potential consequences of this behavior. But before doing that, I'll maybe stop and see if there's any, any questions. Uh, we don't have a question right now, Juan. Uh... Perfect, so let me just blow ahead then. Um, so as kind of I, I alluded to earlier on, a common criticisms of payouts and in particular share reports has been this idea that the cash that firms use in these transactions may leave firms unprepared to face emergencies such as the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Of course, this, you know, this is an argument that has you know, uh, regained a, a lot of notoriety now with, 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 with COVID. Now, however, there's actually been relatively little systematic evidence of payouts effect on, fragi on fragility in, in, in the literature. So for instance, in a recent paper, uh, René Scholz and, and co-authors, they find no evidence that uh, recent payouts made the average firm stock price drop worse during the uncertain early weeks of the COVID-19 crisis. So that is to say, they don't find any association between firms that were paying out uh, capital in 2019 and being more affected by the crisis during this early uh, February and March weeks when kind of uh, firms experience a very substantial uh, stock price price decline. So what, what kind of our hypothesis or what we try to bring to, to, to this analysis here is that it, we believe it is key when you try to find an association between payouts and um, financial fragility, it is key to distinguish between debt finance and internally funded payouts. And we're going to test this in two settings. So one, we're just going to look, essentially, we're going to follow uh, uh, Stolz and Cothers, and we're just going to look at firm stock price reaction to the COVID-19 crisis. And then we're going to kind of take a step back and try to look at a larger sample of, of firms and time periods and look at firms' uh, investment reaction to unexpected industry downturns. And just, you know, I, I, I want to make one, one thing clear now. While you know these shocks, both the crisis and the industry downturns that we're going to exploit, are arguably exogenous or certainly unexpected, uh, I want to make make clear that the firm's decision decision to debt finance payouts clearly is not, and we and we don't have any source of exogenous variation here in you know which firms were let's say having a debt finance payout in 2019 and which ones had an internally funded payout and which ones they were not just paying out at all. Um, so you can think about, about these, these analysis as essentially you know, capturing both the treatment effect uh, of debt finance payouts on financial fragility and also the selection effect associated with debt finance payout. So uh, we see this as kind of suggestive evidence of the, if nothing else, the idea that any association between payouts and financial fragility is likely to be different depending on the source of findings of, of the payouts. But you know, we are cognizant of the fact that we don't really have exogenous variation on firms' payout decisions. So with that caveat, let me, let me show you what, what we find. Um, so here, the, the dependent variable is going to be the cumulative loss at lock excess return from February 3rd to March 23 of 2020. And this is just exactly the same time period as, as Renish Tolson co-author. So you know, we're not 
making it up with just following them. And we are, we are focusing on firms without an investment grade credit rating because these are exactly the kind of firms where you know, any financial fragility is expected to be, to be more, more important. But still recall that these are 72% of all firms that have uh, debt finance uh, repurchases. So what we see is that if you just kind of regress the uh, stock price drop or the excess return of the, of the firms on whether the firm had a repurchase in 2019 and a bunch of other standard controls, you find no significant association between uh, repurchasing in 2019 and having a more negative, uh, significantly more negative uh, stock price drop during the during the, the early days of, of the crisis. However, if you just break down uh, repurchases in general, according to whether they are debt finance or internally funded, you do see that it is indeed, when you look at firms that had a debt finance repurchase in 2019, you do see that these firms had a more negative stock price reaction to the COVID-19 crisis than, than firms that didn't have any reports. Whereas in the case of, of firms that had an internally funded reports, you see no significant difference between the stock price reaction of these firms and those that didn't report at all. And the, and the difference between uh, these two effects, if you will, or these two associations is, uh, is significant. So this suggests that, you know, if you think about this relative to internally funded repurchases, debt finance repurchases, they increase financial fragility because they increase leverage more. Uh, debt finance repurchases increase leverage more than internally funded repurchases, but they decrease it via the cash channel because uh, a firm that has a debt finance repurchase will, will end up with, uh, with less debt than, sorry, will, in, will, will end up with more cash than a firm that has an internally funded repurchase. And so this suggests that kind of the leverage channels dominate because uh, we find a stronger association between debt finance repurchases and financial fragility, at least as captured by this test, than uh, in the case of internally funded repurchase, even though kind of these firms here will end up with more cash, all else equal, than, uh, than these firms here. So as I mentioned, the, the, the next and last thing that, that we do is we kind of try to see whether this, this is a, a, an association that extends beyond just this particular experiment, if you will, of the COVID-19 crisis. And what we, we do here is we run standard investment regressions uh, around uh, instances where firms are facing an unexpected industry shock. And we are gonna just, as is a standard in the literature, we, we what we do here is we look at instances where firms, uh, the median firm in the industry experiences a stock price decline of more than 15%. So what, what you find is that indeed um, investment seems to go down at a, you know, following these industry distress episodes as you would, you would expect. Um, if we just see whether there is an, any additional decline in investment for firms that uh, had uh, a report just during this prior year, you do see how this is actually not the case. And if anything, firms that were repurchasing in the prior year, they seem to be able to invest more both in normal times and also following periods of distress. If you add up these two coefficients, you, you do see a positive association that's marginally significant. So again, if you just consider all repurchases together, you don't see any kind of um, additional fragility or additional need to cut um, investment following an industry shock for firms that had been repurchasing relative to firms that had not. However, if you again break down repurchases according to the financing source, you do again see this very different behavior. Firms that had an internally funded repurchase, they are able to invest more uh, both in normal times and also actually following periods of financial distress relative to firms without repurchases. But firms that had a debt finance repurchase, while they are able to invest more, let's say in normal times, and again, this goes back to this idea that these are firms that are, that are growing, when an unexpected shot hits and their industry goes through this distress period, you see that the firms, they, they, they find themselves in a situation where they have to, or they, they invest less than firms that didn't have any, any repurchase or that had an internal funded repurchase. If you adapt these two coefficients, you find that the, the, the association between having a debt finance repurchase and investment in times of distress is negative, 
and it is uh, signif significantly so. So that kind of, again, um, suggests to us that when you want to try to think about the relationship between payouts and financial fragility, it is key to distinguish between internally funded repurchases and debt finance repurchases, because at least you know, in this um, descriptive uh, sense, if you will, it does appear that you find different behavior in the data following periods of distress for firms with internally funded repurchases and firms with debt finance repurchases. So if, if there's no more questions, I'll, I'll just conclude. Um, so kind of the, the main takeaway for us of the paper is that this commonly held view in the payout literature that payouts are first and foremost a vehicle to return free cash flow to investors is incomplete uh, because we find that finance payouts are prevalent, they are large, and they are uh, persistent over time. We find that firms use that finance payouts to jointly manage their capital structure and cash holdings motivated in particular by tax considerations. Although again, to be clear, uh, there are certainly other motives including agency motives, uh, cross market arbitrage that are also likely to be important drivers of finance payouts and debt finance payouts in particular. And uh, kind of a, an implication of our findings is this idea that not all payouts are created equal when it comes to their impact on financial fragility. So it looks like you know the source of payout financing matters. So if you go back to thinking about the question about the policy implications, that's why I mentioned, well, first of all, treating all payouts the same, that just seems like a very kind of brute instrument. Uh, but perhaps you know, rather than imposing specific limits on payouts or even debt finance payouts, it might make more sense to go back to what incentives are driving firms' behavior to try to increase their leverage in a way that, while it might be optimal in normal times, puts them in a more fragile uh, position when these unexpected shocks uh, hit. And in particular, you know, if you think about government policy, clearly any tax considerations that are driving this behavior, I think that will be the first place where I will go to try to uh, change these, these, these incentives. And kind of, you know, from a big picture standpoint, uh, at least, you know, for us as, a, as academics, I think that our findings highlight the importance of studying firm's liquidity, capital structure, and payout policies as interdependent elements of the corporate financial management decisions of firms, rather than as standalone policies, as, you know, sometimes we've seen, uh, you know, certainly in the payout literature, uh, you know, kind of focus only on, on, on payouts while kind of uh, not, not perhaps being fully aware of this interdependence between payouts, capital structure, and uh, liquidity decisions by firms. So that's, uh, that's all I have for, uh, for today. If there's any, any